Well, hello class. This is our last urinary system lecture. <clears throat> we got this. This one will talk about urine itself a little bit more and uh, talk about uh, something about um, rates of production of urine and actually how you can clear your, your body of substances, talk about kidney function, and um, then we'll get to the lower urinary tract. When you look at the whole urinary tract, you, you know, you've, you've got your kidneys, and then uh, ureter is going down. I'm going to enter the bladder. And then uh, your urethra is going to leave the bladder. And you can kind of talk about this being upper and the lower urinary tract. Often in conjunction with UTIs, urinary tract infections, it can just be a bladder infection, but you don't want it to go and turn to an upper uh, urinary tract infection if it gets up into the kidneys as well. We'll get to the bladder, micturation or, or peeing, and the urethra that, that carries it to the outside. Yeah. You can buy urine on the internet. <laughs> buy deer urine, coyote urine, uh, and other animals. Well, the urine will mix with um, other glands in a deer, give it a particular scent that tell bucks and does different information about sexual receptiveness of, uh, of that and that deer. And urine, yes, stinky. It's uh, a lot of uh, money going into removing pet urine odor and such. It's that ammonia that it's given off. So let us continue talking about urine, shall we? So first of all, talk about urea and uric acid. Um, urea is, is an interesting molecule in that it's one of the early ones that contradicted this vitalism, this idea that um, all the chemicals in our body are so unique. There's something magical about you know life that it can produce these chemicals. And then we made it in the lab, blew that out of the water. So now we know we're made out of chemicals. There's nothing magical. They can all be synthesized in the lab. But uh, urea was one that really kind of uh, turned it around, 1822, yeah. Uh, as a molecule, you can see it has a, a carbonyl group and it has two amine groups, uh, the two uh, nitrogen containing molecules. And you put that together from ammonia. You put a couple ammonia together, uh, oxygen, carbon in there, and you got you have urea. Um, it comes from the breakdown mostly of proteins. Uh, remember the amino acids? <clears throat> You're getting rid of the nitrogen com compounds. So uh, a real Atkins diet, really heavy on, on protein, will be harder on the kidneys. You'll hear that because there's there's more to filter out, definitely. And I don't want to get into it too much, but I, last lecture I talked about the salty gradients, talked about sodium and chloride mostly, but also urea is contributing to that hypertonicity also. And so urea is, is kept in high levels there. I mean, you're, you pee it out, but then you also keep it in this medulla of your kidney. So just leave it at that. And I tell you the very important knowledge that you need is that Fresh urine does not smell quite as bad as urine that's been sitting around for a while because that uh, urea breaks down, <clears throat> water will come in and make, and make ammonia, and then you smell the ammonia. So older urine, much, much worse smell than, than fresher urine. Now uric acid, I mean, it's a bicyclic heterocycline purine derivative. I didn't, don't really know what that means at all, but it's this chemical here, and you can see you get rid of um, four nitrogens with the uric acid, much bigger. And that's mainly a breakdown of uh, nucleic acids. A couple of the purines, um, uh, sound like I know what I'm talking about, will break down and, uh, and uh, give you the uric acid. Um, it's, uh, it's found in our urine, so it's obviously soluble in water, but much less soluble than, uh, than urea or, or, nitrogen or ammonia is. And um, yeah, what's interesting, I want you to know, uh, particular type of um, pathology. I don't know if you guys know this, but when uric acid builds up, uh, it can cause pain in your joints. Particularly, it's almost always your big toe joints where you feel it first. You know what it is? Gout. Most often in men, uh, it's a genetic component. Um, you fixed your diet. You know, you can't eat lobster, seafood, and some other things have a lot of uric acid. They'll, they'll give you a lot of uric acid uh, buildup. And so, um, yeah, these crystals will precipitate, especially in the joints, and you'll, you'll have pain with gout. 
And look at the structure here of, um, of uric acid. It's an interesting little aside here. Imagine this study. There was a correlation between these uric acid levels and publication productivity of university professors. What is going on? And um, there's an idea here that this is um, uh, it's similar to caffeine in structure, and so possibly it's more stim more of a stimulant, and they'll be able to to work longer hours. But anyway, I thought it was a cool study. Uh, you never know. All right, so urine. You know, it's mostly water. It's mostly water. 95% water. Yeah. And it depends. Again, it's more concentrated if you guys are dehydrated. You can make a more concentrated urine or a more watery urine if you're overhydrated. And it just it mirrors your um, your plasma, and so that's why you could take a blood <clears throat> level to look at. Uh, uh, you could look at drugs, or you could look at normal constituents in, in your body, and then you can look at urine, and you know there's some differences there in the plasma and urine because of the filtration and selective resorption and et cetera. But uh, you can look at urine or blood and get a lot of clues about your health. Right. Um, Indeed, and it varies depending on your body's needs. Yeah, so your color of your urine. I guys notice, but first thing in the morning, your urine is darker. Um, you have not drunken for you know eight hours, however long you're sleeping, <clears throat> so it's concentrated. It'll become more watery as you're, you're hydrated as you drink during the day. But definitely, if you um, college students, a lot of America is chronically um, dehydrated. And uh, you want to have light-colored urine. You want to be here, people. You don't want to be down here. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. So the color is a direct correlation <clears throat> to um, to a um, to how hydrated you are. And then also, um, there's a couple of cool things. Obviously, you guys, if you've had asparagus before, you know it stinks pretty soon. Um, beetyuria, people can uh, have beets and get a alarming beet-colored urine. And then your book mentions this blue diaper syndrome where uh, parents are alarmed <laughs> to look at that diaper as this bright blue liquid. Um, I guess it's a mutation where you don't break down an amino acid and then with oxygen it reacts and turns blue. Um, yeah, so and there's some medications too will, will turn your... Um, your urine, different colors, bright yellow, some, I forgot which antibiotic. Um, Wilson's disease is where you uh, you don't excrete copper, and then uh, your urine could be copper colored. If, yeah, so uh, there's some clues to urine. And looking here, this is, my God, Hippocrates. This a long time ago knew that you could look at urine and tell about health. He knew that frothy, all that, that foam could be an indication of uh, uh, kidney disease. He didn't know what a protein was, but I knew there was a problem. And I love it. Look at this chart. I mean, so we've been looking at urine a long time <clears throat> and as health professionals. And a lot of it, this was a lot of this was crap, but uh, I mean, they read too much into it. But uh, definitely, we know today urine is a good uh, little tool to, to talk about our health. And they used to back well, not that long ago, they would, uh, you would uh, not only look and smell urine, uh, you would even taste it. And, oh my God, and I, I didn't do it last year, I don't think. But I, I, when I did the urine lab, I'll just tell you because you're not going to be able to see. I um, <clears throat> put some uh, apple juice in the fridge and then uh, I made a point of getting it out as class was beginning. And you guys are kind of nervous because it's, you know, you got to pee, bring your, look at your pee in front of your classmates. But um, then I would uh, show you, put some gloves on, I would put some in a test tube, some dr drops, and I would just kind of move it around like no big deal. And then, of course, I would talk about how we used to taste it because if um, it was sweet is an indication of diabetes. And then I would say, it's no big deal, it's sterile. And yeah, yeah, I would drink it right there. Some of you were aghast, and, uh, but then I said right away what it was. So there's no drinking in lab, but a yeah, little exception there. But I digress. All right, here's a term for you, renal clearance. This is important to people pharmacologically looking at drugs and uh, other substances. It's, it's a measure of how fast your kidneys can get rid of it. So technically you should know it's the volume of plasma that you can get rid of a substance per minute per time. So sub-substances, 
um, are gotten rid of uh, quickly. Some they're not if your body wants to reabsorb it or not get rid of it. Um, and it's a test of uh, how well your kidneys are working too. Um, one way we can uh, we could measure this renal clearance is give you, there's a chemical called inulin. I know it sounds like insulin, but completely different. And it's just a polysaccharide uh, star sheet you take and uh, your kidneys treat it neutrally. You know, it just comes out in the filtrates. It's not selectively absorbed. It's not pushed out. And so it's a way we can give you a standard amount and then measure how well your kidneys are working. But nowadays, um, you can look at creatinine clearance test. And creatinine is a normal breakdown product of muscle, so you don't have to give them anything. You can just test creatinine levels, you know, just a point test. And if those creatinine levels are high, they can get, you know, 10 times normal, something like that, you know that the kidneys are not filtering it out normally, and you know there's a problem. Um, yeah. And it's, we can measure this, uh, this clearance rate with these chemicals to, to, to calculate uh, GFR. And uh, as you look at kidney, chronic kidney disease and kidney diseases, that GFR, they look how well are your kidneys performing. And uh, this is one measure of it. Renal clearance of glucose, zero, right? Yes, you don't get rid of any of it. Your body uh, does not clear it from the plasma, unless, again, you have extremely high levels. You can eat tons of sugar and you can overload it or often diabetes if it's not controlled too much glucose and you'll find it in your in your urine all right well this should be all familiar to you you should look at this and say i got this i know all these structures the calyces the pyramids of the papilla the cortex the columns coming down the ureter leaving right and uh i put this on there to remind me that once the urine is formed it drips out of these calyces and Again, as it comes down these collecting ducts, that's where your body can work at it. If ADH is there, you can suck back that water. If your hydrate is not there, that pee comes out really watery. But once it makes its way into the calyces and the renal pelvis and the ureter, there's no, you don't change it. That's it. You've made your urine. Um, we'll see in your gallbladder, you, you the water, you concentrate it in that gallbladder, but your urinary bladder just holds the urine. So the urine is made in the tubes and then it is drips out of the, the papilla into the calyces and that's it. That's your, your urine. Hey, all right. Now we're going to get to the, the anatomy and uh, how it works um, on its way down. Well, this, my God, you guys, if I was in class, I would ask you this and some of you would get it. Because early on, <clears throat> the first semester we studied, um, first lab, histology, and we looked at stratified squamous, simple squamous, cuboidal, columnar, and there was transitional epithelium. And you guys all looked at it, you studied it, and I said it's only found in the bladder and, and close by. And that's true. This is the epithelium you find, uh, anyway, it's starting actually in the calyces and in the, um, all the way down down the ureters and in the bladder and in some of the urethra. And transitional means it can transition. It can change. When your bladder is empty, looks like it's many layers and thick. When your bladder is expanded and stretched out, those cells will kind of even slide by each other a little bit and it'll be much thinner. And then you empty your bladder and it's balled up again. So this thing like transition lenses when you go out in the sun, they turn darker. This epithelium changes every time you fill and empty your bladder. Yeah, so it's beautiful epithelium. You look at it kind of as these rounded tops is how I kind of recognize it. And uh, it's a good barrier. That urine in your bladder, you don't want those things like leaking in between it to get into the back into the body. So it's a nice barrier to that. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous, right? Transitional epithelium. See the rounded tops? The cells are kind of roundish and they'll, they'll slide by each other. Yeah, so here's the path. If I asked you, you know, it's the path that uh, urine takes. Oh my God, well, it starts as filtrate back in the glomerulus, putting it into the Bowman's capsule, and then it goes proximal tube all the way down. And at this point, um, you're out the collecting duct and you're in the minor calyx, major calyx, the pelvis is where it all collects, the two ureters, I'm gonna carry it down, talk about those next. We'll talk about the bladder, and finally the urethra is the tube to the outside. 
So your ureters that come down from each kidney, um, they move the urine down by squeezing like peristalsis. There's a wave of muscle. So when the renal pelvis becomes filled with urine, it'll, it'll squeeze and it'll move this urine down all the way down to the bladder, all the way down to the bladder. And when you're drinking a lot, when you're peeing and making a lot of urine, it'll, it'll come by, you know, every few seconds, it'll come down. And then when you're sleeping, it's, or when you're not drinking much, it'll just, you know, every few minutes, it'll come down. So these waves of peristalsis will move the pee down. So eventually it's going to squirt into the bladder at the other end. So it doesn't just fall down the tube by gravity. It's squeezed down there. And looking at it, it's going to be lined with transitional epithelium. You can see it looks kind of, you know, like, like this. But if you stretched it out, it would be whole like that. If you had a kidney stone, or something like that. And if you do get a stone blocking this, your, uh, your the smooth muscle in this uh, ureter will, will contract violently. It'll be very painful because it's trying to move that stone down. So the two ureters, you can see, they're about 25 centimeters, just about, just about 10 inches, and uh, they're retroperitoneal. They're stuck behind this membrane and they go down from the bladder over the pelvic brim and then into the bladder on the back on either side, right and left. And the ureters, um, yeah, we'll see. They have a, it's gonna be a, a inner mucosa. It's gonna have the transitional epithelium. Then there's gonna be a, a submucosa that has uh, blood vessels and nerves and you know, a lot of elastic tissue that can stretch. And then finally, uh, um, actually we don't even get into that. There's a small there. And then you have a muscular, it's gonna be smooth muscle out here. And then there'll be connective tissue and fat on this fibrous coat. So here we have the mucosa coat in the middle. And then, don't talk about the submucosa, but it's there. And then the muscle is gonna be smooth muscle. It's gonna push the urine down. And then the fibrous coat will be connective tissue, blood vessels and nerves and fat will be out there. So it's a beautiful view. See all the fat out there, but you can see the beautiful transitional epithelium there and then these rows and rows of smooth muscle. They're gonna propel the urine down to the bladder. Now, interestingly, the two ureters don't just empty into it just straight up. They come at a severe angle. They come, both of them come at an angle. Now, why would they come at, why is that important? You can take a look at that picture. It's pretty cool. As the bladder fills, as the pressure gets more in the bladder, it's gonna press against this and acts as a valve. And so as the bladder fills and the pressure gets more and more, you don't want that urine refluxing back up the ureters to the kidney and so the more pressure there is the more this the ureters are squeezed shut because of this severe angle that they go through yeah so it's kind of a self um, closing um, valve when the, when the pressure comes in and for instance if the bladder pressure is too much it can go back and i've seen kidneys where they're this is a probably because of an obstruction or cancer in the ureter but that the the whole inside of the kidney is just like space where the pressure has been for so long it just pushes the kidney out yeah so the valve you want urine to go down you don't want to come back up and you know as i mentioned urinary tract infections it can go back bacteria can travel from the bladder up but the, by coming in at a sharp angle it helps uh, prevent backflow the bladder the bladder there's lots of bladders urinary bladder is the, the full name of it and uh, it's this, uh, it's smaller than you think. It's pretty small when you look at a cadaver. And some of them, they depends when they die, if it was full or open, some will be, you know, this big like that and thin walled. Or if it's balled up, it'd be thick walled. And if it's balled up, they have lots of grooves in there, lots of folds. And when it's filled, it kind of thins out and gets smooth. And you guys live your life like that. You fill it, you empty it. Every day you're doing that. Um, surrounded by smooth muscle it every goes every which direction so that if you contract it it's going to cause the pressure in the bladder to increase and if the sphincters are open the urine can leave it's found in your pelvis um, you feel your your pelvis bones get behind that when it's really full it can it can come up not, I mean, they say the belly button not quite as 
much we can like feel your bladder even if you push you know above your pubic bone if it's really full uh, in babies it comes up a little farther than uh, than in adults um, and it differs i'll show you a picture of male and female you're going to see it's a little different because females have an additional apparatus there between the bladder and the and the large intestine <clears throat> And I'll also show you in the ureter, this trigone, in the ureter, I'm sorry, in the bladder. The bladder has a trigone, this triangle. And it's going to be made up of the two ureters coming in here and the urethra leaving here. So it's kind of a smooth area that always is a constant in your bladder. And the layers, the mucus coat is going to have um, transitional. Oh, here we mentioned a submucous. Mucus is going to have some connective tissue, big muscle, the smooth muscle. And then you're going to have on the outside connective tissue and uh, a membrane out there. The muscle in your bladder that causes you to pee is the detrusor muscle. Detrusor. Going every which direction on this sphere, it's going to help just contract it to push that pee out. Ah, male, female. We'll get to at the end, we'll, well, I'll show you something very similar to your reproductive system. But just to show you here, your pubic symphysis here, your pubic bone is up in front, remember? your pubis, your ischemia, your ilium, and there's a mound of fat in front of that, and then right behind it is going to be the uh, the bladder. So looking at women here, females, you can see that you have a vagina and a uterus here between the bladder and the rectum or large intestine. In males over here, you see, uh, you don't see that, obviously, you see a large intestine and then you see the bladder here. So there's a space here that we don't have in the females because it's this apparatus is right there. You can also see why pregnant women, when that have to pee a lot, because that uh, uterus gets huge, it's got to press on that bladder. So it's no secret that pregnant women have a smaller bladder because it's the uterus is just pushing everything out of the way. And one thing this brings up too is uh, the difference between males and females is that in males, that urethra is going to be used for both urine and semen and reproductive. In females, you see there's separate holes. You have a, the urethra and the vagina, like that. But males, this urethra is gonna carry the sperm and it's gonna carry the urine. And so I can see there's a gland here called the prostate gland, which you all heard of, and there's a little Y, a Y in there. This is where you could have uh, one product or the other going through it. And you also notice the urethra in males is much longer because it goes through the whole penis. and uh, that's also going to be, an effect of that is going to be that females get bladder infections more often, UTIs more, more often, because they're just so much closer to the outside world. Bacteria can get in easier. Males, there's that longer urethra. It's filled with mucus glands, and uh, even peeing kind of washes it out. And so uh, it's harder for the bacteria. It's got a longer path to get into the bladder. Yeah. Ah, oh, close up here. Here's this trigone. See it's it's subtle, but when you look at a, um, a bladder, it's, the rest of it can scrunch up a bit. That kind of stays like a solid, uh, smooth triangle there. And if I ask you what are the three points to the, to the trigone, you say it's the, the two uretic orifices or the two openings of the, the two ureters, and then down here is the urethra where it leaves. And I'll show you the male here. You can see this big gland. Here's the prostate gland. It makes a lot of fluids. And then on either side, here's the two vas deferens coming in. That's going to carry the sperm all the way from the testes. And then these big seminal vesicles are glands that make a lot of fluid too. So the seminal vesicles and prostate makes a lot of fluid. And uh, the sperm come up from these ductus deferens or vas deferens to meet, to mix with that fluid. And then in the prostate, um, you can see there's that Y where um, this opening, either this can be open or this can be open, but not both at the same time. Oh, here's a view, kind of an ugly view. Look inside the bladder. You can see here the two holes where the ureters come from the right and left kidney, and then the urethra is leaving it. There's a view. Look at how muscular it is. Indeed, I talked about the urethra. So the urethra is a tube. Um, the outer, the last part of it will be stratified squamous, just like the skin, but the beginning part will be the transitional. Um, mucus glands along its, along its path uh, will help prevent infections, actually, you know, just like you have mucus in your respiratory tract. 
And the, the P hole at the opening here is the external urethral orifice to get technical on you. So it's the, the internal urethral orifice will be where it leaves the bladder. The external is where it leaves the body, indeed. And in women, it's a small hole just above the vaginal opening right here. And in men, right there at the end of the penis, obviously. Yeah, so to reiterate, uh, women have a much shorter distance from the outside world, the bacteria and fungi and things that would like to live in there uh, and the inside than males do. In males even, we, it's, it's much longer. We talk about the part going through the prostate being prosthetic urethra. And then there's a, a little piece that would be the membranous urethra. And then finally the penile urethra or spongy to the end. So in males, we even talk about three different uh, areas to it. And in, in, in females, it's just the urethra. Yeah, you can see, again, <clears throat> that's the female urethra. And the male goes through a prostate part here, a little membranous part here, uh, and then a penile or spongy right here. It's a little more complex. Here's a view of a urethra, and uh, I guess I would point out uh, all these, these mucus glands, so to produce mucus along that uh, um, too. All right, peeing, urination, micturation. These are all terms for, well, you should know one out of the three at least, right? Um, <clears throat> look at the bladder. I threw this in here. It's just interesting. You think about, you feel the urge to urinate. And um, what's happened here, of course, is volume and pressure are related, right? Uh, <clears throat> the volume, the more pressure that you feel. And so uh, the bladder uh, will fill. And as you can see, it's going to fill quite a lot of volume without you feeling that pressure because there's room in there. And so the, the, the fluid fills. But as soon as it fills the bladder to the point where it's actually starting to stretch the bladder wall, that's where you feel the need, the real urge to, to urinate. And then you can actually put it off a little bit, <laughs> but it's going to continue to fill. You know, you not wanting, not wanting to stop the car is not going to stop you know, urine from collecting in your bladder. Um, it's not going to, this problem is not going to go away. Um, well, it can go away one way, but you know. Um, and then eventually, uh, as, as you get that point, it's, it becomes critical when the bladder is full and it's not being able to stretch anymore. And then uh, uh, the signals get stronger and stronger. So it's kind of cool to look at that. Um, oh, and I have a, a little animation to show you, but um, pretty much you should know that um, the stretch receptors are going to go to uh, an area down in your, your sacral region of your spinal cord, and it's a reflex. And what you have is a sphincter that's part of the, the bladder wall. So the bladder wall, the detrusor muscle, the smooth muscle, there's a sphincter at the end where it leaves the urethra. And that's smooth muscle too. You don't control it. And then there's another um, sphincter, the external sphincter that you do control. And that's just outside of it. It's part of the muscles that make up your pelvic floor and that you do control. So what happens is that the bladder stretches, it sends signals to your sacral region of your spinal cord. And that comes up and tells your brain, it comes up and tells your brain. And you know, when you have control of it, you can go down and talk to it. You can inhibit, you can say, I know I have to pee. I can't stop right now, that kind of thing. So you have um, conscious control once you're after, you're like two or three years old, right? As a baby, you don't, but you mature into that being able to control this. But as the stretching continues to make the, the, the need to, to urinate stronger, that internal sphincter will relax, you're ready to go, but you still control that external urethral sphincter. And um, you're able to keep that closed and it'll put off urinating. And then until you give the signal that you wanna relax that external sphincter, the detrusor muscle and a reflex will contract, the sphincter is open, and now the urine will leave the body until the, the bladder is contracted. And then it'll relax, the sphincters will close again, and the bladder can slowly fill again. And there's my long-winded explanation there. And uh, I think I'll go ahead and we'll see if this um, short video will, will, will make it clear for you.
The micturition reflex involves impulses traveling from the urinary bladder to the sacral region of the spinal cord and from the sacral region of the spinal cord back to the bladder. It is coordinated by neurons in the spinal cord and can be influenced by signals from the brain. When the urinary, when the urinary bladder, bladder becomes stretched, becomes stretched there, is there is an increase in the frequency, in the frequency of action potentials, action potentials carried from the bladder from the wall, wall to the sacral region of the spinal cord. In response, in response parasympathetic, parasympathetic neurons, neurons from the spinal, from the spinal cord, cord to the bladder, to the bladder are, activated, are activated, and this causes, and this causes the, smooth the smooth muscle on the bladder, on the bladder wall to contract. To contract. The sensory, the sensory signals, signals to the sacral, to the sacral region of the spinal cord, spinal cord also, stimulate also stimulate ascending pathways, pathways to the pons and cerebrum, which results, which results in a conscious, in a conscious desire, desire to urinate. To urinate. If urination, if urination is, not is not convenient at the time, at the, time the, brain the brain sends impulses, sends impulses down the spinal down cord, cord to inhibit the micturition reflex. reflex. Impulses, impulses carried via carried somatic, somatic motor, motor neurons, neurons keep the external, keep the external urinary, urinary sphincter, sphincter contracting, contracting, which also which prevents also urination. urination. When urination, when urination is, desired, is desired, signals from signals the brain, from the brain stimulate, stimulate the micturition reflex. reflex. The brain also the brain decreases, decreases action potentials action in the somatic, somatic motor, motor neurons, neurons to relax, to relax the, the external, external urinary, urinary sphincter. sphincter. That was very nice. That was really, that was really, really good. Yeah, hopefully you guys saw that. Very cool. So you see how you do have control. Again, urination is unusual in that you, you lose control early in life and late in life in many cases. Uh, not always, but you'll see that. But once you have control over urination, uh, you're able to uh, inhibit that reflex and keep your sphincter closed until, again, your cerebrum will let that, the sacral region know that uh, you're ready to go and it will release the sphincter, somatic, and then autonomic will, will compress the uh, bladder. And it's parasympathetic. All right, almost done here. Um, so some abnormalities. I mean, uh, usually people are born with two kidneys. Uh, this horseshoe kidney is interesting here where uh, they're, they're still connected. Um, in terms of what I would want you to know, um, this one, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, that you need to know. That's all I will ask you about uh, on the test. But realize some some things um, um, uh, do happen besides that. All right. So finally, um, urinary system. Well, you have two kidneys, and so as you age, you probably there's not great great changes in our cardiovascular respiratory system, but your urinary system usually. You know, it, it lasts in, until you're older. It's unlikely um, to be the thing that wears out and kills you. Although I say that with a caveat that um, kidney disease is very common as well and is, is a big killer. Um, and don't forget, if you if you have ki loss of kidney function, we call it hemodialysis or dialysis, where you can put you on a machine and uh, uh, transplant um, operation is usually very successful. But as you get older, uh, pharmacologically, it's important to know the age of the patients because um, you don't uh, break down uh, chemicals and, and, and drugs as easy uh, as you age. The whole uh, functioning, you're, you're, you get less and less glomeruli. You hit a peak in 20s and 30s and just goes downhill. You lose more and more. But because you have two kidneys and you know you can live with one, even if you lost 50% of each of your kidneys, you still have enough you know to survive that's a really good way of thinking of it isn't it so usually the redundancy uh even though you have a downward your your glomeruli turn into connective tissue become useless more and more of your kidney becomes um, not useful for filtering blood but you have enough kidney so that you can still survive uh, until probably something else will kill you uh, most uh, elderly people, a great percentage, have proteinuria, definitely protein in there. They often have the, uh, you lose elasticity in the bladder, actually. You know, old people have to pee more, and it's often comes upon them quickly, and it's more urgent. And then you, oh, you should know the word incontinence. Incontinence is uh, not being able to control your pee. And so they make uh, adult diaper kind of situation, things like that, or... Even after a pregnancy, sometimes the muscles of the pelvic floor get disrupted and cause incontinence in that case. So incontinence, not ability to control. I, I could ask you that. Um, and definitely, uh, they become your GFR, your ability, your, your 
clearance rate of various drugs is generally just goes down uh, across the board. All right, we will I'll have one more chapter in the next test is a short one on, on fluid and electrolytes. Uh, but the kidneys, this was a, was a hairy one, it was a big one. The last lecture was, was quite long, looking at counter current multiplier, things like that. The anatomy should be straightforward. Um, so it's the kidney lecture. Make sure you do the lab on the kidneys. Uh, that will help just reinforce it. I don't know if it matters which, which you do first, but uh, they're both are, will work synergistically for you. And uh, all right, I hope you learned the kidney well. This, this was helpful.